understanding the, the difference between the terms cryptocurrency, fiat, and digital are really important. So fiat currency, we know, is just currency that's backed by uh, a federal government. So the US dollar, the Russian ruble, the Canadian dollar. Um, so this is uh, our fiat currencies, you know, they're stable. They give us um, confidence in, uh, in the system. You know, this is, this is how we've operated for a long time. So the digital form of currency is just fiat in that digital medium. So think about um, platforms like Venmo uh, and Apple Pay and things like that. And then cryptocurrency is a whole different kind of ball of wax. So these are cryptographic digital assets. Um, they're decentralized, so they're not backed by any um, government. They are not owned by anyone. So there is no Bitcoin LLC or Bitcoin Inc. There's not one person or even a group of people who are uh, in charge of the blockchain or any blockchain. Um, so it, it's um, it's controlled by no one. And so then this always begs the question, I get this from law enforcement and from students, you know, is cryptocurrency real? Is it funny money? Uh, and so we can have that whole existential conversation another time, but uh, we have to operate under the assumption that it is real. People do pay a lot of money for it. Um, Bitcoin is worth $55,000 right now for one Bitcoin. Uh, and so you can think about it in terms of, you know, why do baseball cards have value? People trade them and put value into it. So thinking about it from that standpoint, hopefully should um, clarify some of some of that. The first thing that happens behind the scenes that you're not going to see in this cryptographic process is it's going to generate what's known as a seed. And so a seed is uh, this is an example of a seed generation an Electrum wallet. You create your wallet, it's going to um, generate a seed. This seed is going to be a phrase of between 12 and 24 words typically, but you can, for some wallet applications, um, you are able to add you know, an extra word here, there. And so this seed phrase is hugely, hugely important because if you lose the password to your, um, to your wallet, if you, for whatever reason, um, say your wallet is installed, so you have Electrum installed on your, your computer at home, something happens to your computer, you want to be able to restore your funds, this seed is what will allow you to do that. So you can go to any, um, theoretically, there's some restrictions here and there, uh, always exceptions to the rules, but essentially you could download Electrum on any other device, uh, input your seed, and you basically at that point are restoring your wallet. So it's generating new public-private key pairings um, and it is, is restoring your funds. So if you lose this seed, and you don't have the password, your funds are gone forever. Um, can you change the number? You know, if I didn't like the word tiny, could I change that word? No. Um, if I didn't like the word stamp in the third position here, can I move it to the first? No. Um, so it has to appear in this particular order. And that's why for law enforcement, you'll see seeds written down in ledgers that have a very particular order. And if law enforcement is able to recover this seed, theoretically, we would be able to then gain access to that suspect's account, given that we have legal authority to do so. And then we have peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. So there are, like Paxful is a, a huge peer-to-peer -peer exchange where you can go on the website, it operates similar to Coinbase, except when you're, you're logged into Paxful, instead of paying Coinbase and using Coinbase for those transactions, Paxful will just set you up essentially with someone else who has Bitcoin. So if you want, you have fiat and you want Bitcoin, it basically just facilitates that transaction between whomever has uh, the Bitcoin, you know, amount that you're interested in. Or you could go to one of these websites, localbitcoins.com. This is for um, Bitcoin and local.bitcoin.com local .bitcoin for Bitcoin Cash. So, and you can see the price that they're offering. So some have a significantly upcharged uh, for their services. So if you're willing to do this, this could be another way of more anonymously transacting or at least cashing in and cashing out. It's definitely by far not the most uh, popular just because exchanges are so easy to use. And even if you don't want to give all of your information to KYC exchanges, you can go use one overseas. Uh, that does not have as much security. Some law enforcement agencies miss the point that um, they think at this point they've confiscated it because they have their seed phrase. They have the suspect seed phrase and now they've gained access to the account, um, but you haven't confiscated it at that point, you've just accessed it. And so say bad guy or gal gets out of jail, uh, they have the seed phrase too, and they realize they, so they can 
access their account um, and they realize that you haven't moved the funds, they move the funds out of there and they're gone uh, forever at that point. So you won't be able to use the seed phrase to do anything. Um, so seed phrase is great, but you have to remember that second step is actually move them into a, a wallet controlled by your agency. So uh, the seed phrase could be located in a word or text file or physically written down. I've seen it uh, in a number of different ways. And then to keep in mind the number of seed words to look for, um, sometimes you'll see smart criminals write down uh, 11 words and there's one missing because that's the one they remembered. Uh, so people necessarily aren't going to memorize 12 seed, you know, seed words. Uh, but they could memorize one, and if they know that the word they've memorized goes in the third position, then that basically thwarts law enforcement too. The research question that my team tackled was, uh, if we only had the suspect's phone, what could we recover in terms of digital forensic artifacts that would then allow us as law enforcement to seize the funds? And so for phase one, which was last year, we had, uh, there were some issues with Celebrate, and Android, so we were only able to really look at apps on iOS phones. So we had four Bitcoin apps, four Ether apps, and then three Monero apps. And so this is, Monero is a dark coin, which means um, it, it has its own blockchain. So it's, it's its own native coin, but it obscures the transactions in such a way that when you're looking at the, their version of the public block explorer, there's no way um, really to tell which payments are intended payments, which are um, just obfuscated, basically white noise. So it becomes very difficult. And so criminals are being encouraged more and more to move into the dark coin realm like Monero because it, it basically thwarts our ability to track and trace them. So that's why I wanted to focus on dark coins too, because if we could collect um, information, forensic information off of a phone and we could seize the funds, then we don't need to worry about tracking and tracing anything at that point. Um, and then in phase two, we expanded, uh, we are able this year to include Android. So we're looking at Bitcoin again for different wallet apps, just because Bitcoin is king. Most people still are uh, interacting with Bitcoin. But then we also have Litecoin, which I think is the number two or three crypto right now in terms of market share. And then we have Zcash, which is another dark coin. And, and this is a, an interesting, as a whole, it operates a little bit differently than Monero. Um, but it is still considered a privacy coin. So we are in the process of this. So I don't have any results to share with regards to um, phase two, but for phase one in one app for every, um, every type of cryptocurrency, we were able to get enough information to be able to recover the funds. So in some cases we recovered a seed, in other cases we were able to recover the private key uh, and the password. We also found some interesting things for anybody interested are familiar with the digital forensic world, that some of the apps were actually caching different pictures from essentially Snapchat and other apps do this too. When you're using your app and you're, you're um, just in your daily activities, the app in the background is basically taking screenshots of your phone and storing it in the cache database. Um, so you don't know it, it doesn't show up in your, your, your pictures on your phone or anything like that. But if you use the app enough, the chances are uh, or the chances increase that it could capture, uh, you know, maybe a private key or the seed or, or a transaction or something that could give you more information. So that was kind of an interesting second, you know, secondary finding for our study. It's very important, no matter if you're law enforcement or private sector companies or an individual to, um, who's worried about ransomware attacks or, or whatever the case might be, is to have a plan before you need one. And everybody says that, um, but it is so true. Uh, I've seen it firsthand um, with ransomware victims and um, for everything else, where if you don't understand how to uh, to seize, or I'm sorry, if you don't understand how to obtain cryptocurrency safely, and you don't know how to store it safely, um, and have a plan to seize it, if you're law enforcement, there's steps. So my project, the SENA project, one of our deliverables is basically a step-by-step -step guide on how to seize it in different situations. Um, have a plan for identifying high-risk customers, have a plan for trying to identify and set thresholds for concerning amounts and transactions. If you're doing any sort of investigation, law enforcement or private sector, for tracking and tracing, really nothing is going to um, let you succeed in your investigation as much as the proprietary software. 
And that is unfortunate because it is a very high um, cost barrier to entry. Mm -hmm.